recording. All right, good. I have to, hopefully I remember to stop it. All right, well, um, tonight's actually kind of an introduction anyway, so more or less is fine, but I'm going to give you kind of a brief, you know, what are we trying to do? Uh, and I have some text for you too, the book that we're going to use. You've already, Matt's already looked at small catechism. Maureen, um, had, you went through, you were confirmed, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's old hat for you. Um, but I wanted to show you something before we get too far along, because one of the questions is, you know, what... Is this the whole catechism? No, no, this is just, it's, it's like our textbook, but it leads us through, leads us through the catechism, um, but does it in kind of a narrative way, so that's, <clears throat> it's a little less children. Yeah, didache, so didache means um, teaching. Yeah, it means teaching in, uh, in Greek. And there's actually an ancient text called the Didache. It's one of the oldest um, doctrin uh, doctrinal manuals, really like a catechism, mm -hmm. um, from the first century. And so probably, it's probably 20 years, maybe, maybe by even 80 or 90 AD. So pretty early. And it goes through goes through the different doctrines um, of the church. It has some really interesting things in it, actually. You can find, it's public domain, of course, <laughs> 2,000 years old. But you can, um, you can look this up uh, on the internet. It's the same name, but it's, it's, a different, it's a different work. It's the ancient work. And it's, it, it has all sorts of fun stuff in it. But it basically, you know, walks the, the, the new Christian through the doctrine of the church and and a lot of things um, that maybe we don't spend as much time on is like, what's the nature of evil? You know, this actually has a whole section on that, which is kind of interesting. All right, so what I wanted to show you before we get too far along is, um, this is especially appropriate for Matt, because you, know, you have two children in the school, um, so it's worth kind of pointing out what we do that's different with adults. Um, than we do with children. So this is our website. I went under church and I'm going to go down to catechesis and confirmation and I wanted to show you a chart that's on here. I was going to print it off but I didn't get to that. Uh, I think, is it this one? Yep, there it is. All right. So you see that? Oh yeah, you can see that just fine. All right, so uh, on the left, this is what we do in the school. This is kind of the expectation for the life of, of the Christian in the school, right? So divine service each week. Um, we have the congregation at prayer. Uh, this is actually from last year because we do it each day in the classroom. Um, so we have chapel every day now, not just Wednesdays. That was last year. Mm -hmm. That was a change. Uh, so the way we did it last year is I would meet with the children once a week and the, the teachers would do something similar in the classroom each day. This year, I just do it. Um, and that's mostly, mm, well, it's beneficial for the teachers to listen rather than have to teach all the time, right? Uh, and then, of course, Sunday school, Sunday morning catechesis, it's really the same thing. It's just two different words for the same thing. And, uh, and then we have the learn at home, learn by heart catechism. So that's expected. And we do that in all these settings. We do it at the school. You know, there's assigned um, to do it at home. It's part of our curriculum when we go through specific um, catechesis with pastor is it'll depend on your children your children are pretty smart so you know and, and they mm, is sovereign reading not quite. not quite yeah so once they can read pretty well then we can they can start in the old testament class because they can read the stories right and then we can talk about it so that may be fifth grade it might be you know sixth grade it could be fourth grade it depends on the child and then uh, so we go through the catechism in that too and then we have um we have three years, actually, that we do with children. So the first year we do Old Testament, and it's 32 weeks, I think. Let me check to make sure. I can't remember, 32 or 36? 32. Yeah, 32 weeks. And so we read a Bible story. There's a catechism reading that goes with it, and there's terms, and then we talk through the story. All right, and then the year two, same idea, except New Testament. All right, same, so... We're reading the scriptures together with me. The catechism is kind of a sideline, you know, side note, um, because the catechism doesn't tell us what to believe the Bible does. The catechism only says what we believe, but it has to agree with the Bible. So we read the Bible, mm -hmm. right? All right. And then the third year is kind of the most intense. That's this one, Lutheran catechesis. 
Yeah, yeah. This and this this is a great. The reason why it's thicker is it has all sorts of reference material in it. So this is the kind of um, this is a great book to have on your shelf and whatnot. And adults can do this too, but you're talking about sixty four plus twenty four is what sixty eight it's eighty eight weeks. Um, you know, over a span of three years, and um, we don't do that with children. So let's look over here. Here's the adult column. Yeah, there it is. So again, we have daily prayer, divine service, daily prayer, Sunday morning catechesis. You learn the catechism, um, Old Testament, New Testament stories, but we do it different with adults. It's fine. I hope you're fine. <laughs> um, with adults, it's, it's backloaded instead of frontloaded. So instead of going through all those readings, um, the, ho the hope or the expectation is that you would continue in the church and hearing those readings and then hearing them preached upon going to Bible study, um, that sort of thing. Uh, I say hope because in actuality, uh, a lot of people go through this and then they kind of attend, they kind of don't. And so then everything that we learn, which is meant to be like the foundation, you know, who is Jesus? Everything gets built upon that, but the rest of the building will happen. You know, um, like in Matt's case, as you teach your children, right? Or as you, really help us in the school do that, etc. So then you can see at the end, um, I'd say 24 weeks. I mean, it could be 12 weeks. It doesn't really know. Uh, it, it varies. It depends on how much, I mean, Lutheran background, you've spent a lot of time preparing already. So, you know, reading through the catechism. So it may not take that long. All right. So there you go. So there is a difference. This came up because somebody asked me, it's like, well, why can't I just bring my high school youth person to this? They come for, you know, 10, 12, 18, whatever weeks. Uh, why do they need to come to three years of classes? I'm like, well, they don't need to, but it's a benefit, right? It's a gift to be able to study the scriptures together for that length of time. Um, so that's it. Test, test yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you don't really ever test out of the Bible. I mean, that's the, I mean, I don't. I, I still, there's large swaths of the scriptures I don't know at all, you know. Not doesn't mean I haven't read it. It's just like I, I couldn't like like the Proverbs. I couldn't quote most of those just the, like kind of some of the most famous ones. Um, I haven't really like inculcated them. I don't know if I meant to do that, but that's fine. Uh, inculcated them, you know, to the point where I could just recite them, you know, whereas maybe large chunks of the New Testament, certainly the Gospels and Epistles, some Old Testament, but not that much either. Maybe the Psalms because we use those pretty intensely here. That's intentional on my part. That wasn't really the case before I came. But we pray at least one whole psalm each Sunday. And we have a psalm assigned during the week that we pray in the school and in the home. So, um, you know the Apocrypha? Mm, yeah. The Apocrypha is kind of... Because we don't uh, derive doctrine from those books. These are the book, inter, usually intertestamental books. There's some exceptions. But the ones written between the Old Testament and New Testament. Um, they... Uh, they're not included in the canon of, of, of the scripture, you know, in the 66 books. But Lutherans historically have included them in their Bibles and they just hold a secondary position. So they're useful for, for devotional reading, um, but we don't take doctrine from them, right? So like, for example, uh, you know, you had that Roman Catholic background, their primary text for, um, for the doctrine of purgatory comes from the Apocrypha. But it's not very easy to, defend without it <laughs> from the rest of scripture. I mean, maybe with first Peter and the harrowing of hell, but even then that's not really what that text is about. And we don't really know what it's about anyway. We have all sorts of nice ideas, but so, um, yeah, no, we, we haven't really plumbed the depths of the scriptures. I haven't myself and I've been a pastor for uh, almost 12 years now. And, um, is that right? When did I start? 2010. Oh, May 2000? Almost 12 years, yeah. Almost 12 years here this year. I haven't really... I, I feel like I'm starting to scrape, get a little bit below the surface maybe, not just scraping the surface now. Yeah, I know. And uh, that's... Um, well, and that's true not just in the Christian tradition, but in other traditions. Like when you have, you know, any kind of tradition that has a wisdom, wisdom text or sacred text that have wisdom, is that, you know, the wisdom of them isn't necessarily immediately apparent. Yeah, and so digging digging deep into that. Um, one of the reasons why we do what we do 
is I had this article. It's a summary of a Barna study. I'll let you look at it in a minute. But I'll just read you a little bit of it. Um, it's found that this was this was this year. Only two percent of parents of American preteens have a biblical worldview. That was the yeah. Sixty-seven percent of parents claim Christianity, and yet most of them hold uh, help, hold syncretistic views, meaning um, there's they have, they take the Christian faith and they meld it with something else. So they've got a mixture. We, you can call that heterodox. They call it syncretistic here. So only 2% they found of preteen parents held a consistently biblical worldview, which does explain a lot of things we're seeing with, with youth, right? Um, so, you know, we can blame it on the schools, which, which is kind of the popular thing to do today. Oh, you know, they're indoctrinating the kids. According to the study, uh, it wasn't that, it's not that great amongst Christians, actually. Among those identifying as Christians, the number isn't much better. 4% hold a biblical worldview. Right. 2% of, of American parents, uh, parents of preteens, and only 4% of Christians. Instead, most of these parents are subscribing to a hodgepodge of uh, ideas and philosophies. Mm. Yeah, this is George Barna. He's a famous um, pollster. He does a lot of re religious poll polling. Um, actually, Missouri Senate has commissioned him to do a poll a while ago, I think. Uh, along with the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University. Here's the quote. Shockingly, few parents intentionally speak to their children about beliefs and behavior based on a biblical worldview, Barna said. Perhaps the most powerful worldview lesson parents provide is through their own behavior. Yet our studies consistently indicate that parental choices generally do not reflect biblical principles or in an intentionally Christian approach to life. So... Uh, worldview is a term that was coined by Francis Schaeffer. Have you ever heard of Francis Schaeffer? Um, he had a Christian commune in Switzerland. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but communes were a thing back in the 70s, right? Um, La something or other. Libera? La Maybe. Um, he's, he's famous for coining this phrase. His worldview is just like, um, you know, how do you see... Your life, how do you see um, not only the world, but things like, um, you know, politics or you know, culture, you know. And, and he, what he was kind of fighting against already, and which is, we've really seen the fruit of it now, is this divergence between, here's what I believe and here's what I do, or here's what I think, right? And that they're like two separate things for a lot of people, completely divorced in, in many cases. Um, and, and that the faith ends up not having any kind of imp impact upon how you think, how you act, you know, how you might even behave like in your business, you know, your ethics, right? We call that, uh, which is, which is weird since the Bible seems to have quite a bit to say about all of that. Right. And so what, um, there's another sociologist from uh, Notre Dame university, his name, uh, Christian Smith. He, uh, he coined a, a phrase, oh, probably that's well, probably been 10 years now, at least. Um, I'll write it down because it's complicated. But this, this, he found through another study, so he studied youth in particular, moralistic, um, oh, I don't know how to spell therapeutic. How do you spell it? P-U-E? Is that right? I think I E first. E first? Okay, therapeutic deism. So that, that's, he found that like 89% of the, of the youth that he polled, this was like 10 years ago now, this, was, this would be the, probably the most effective way to describe how they viewed spirituality in general. So moralistic, tells you what to do and what not to do. That's pretty straightforward, right? Therapeutic, tells you what to do and what not to do so that you feel better or you feel bad, right? Um, so sometimes in order for it to make you feel good, you have to change the moral so that you feel better, right? Yeah, we could see some how that plays out like in gender issues today is a big one with that, right? I feel like a girl and if you tell me I'm not, then it makes me feel bad, so I have to change the rules. Right, yeah. And it's, we, we have one at random, at least one at random school. They have a litter box in the classroom. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, and the point, the reason why I shared the Barna is that the parents are not helping. They're not, they're not providing any kind of 
um, insulation from this. Um, so schools are only doing what the parents actually. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then deism, right? So uh, it's it's lowercase g God, right? Yeah, it's just it's just God with a lowercase, not any specific God necessarily, just that there's some kind of higher power, or something that sets the moralistic thing and wants you to basically wants you to feel feel good or to be happy. So there's a guy up in the sky or girl or non-gender, I guess, some spiritual thing um, that they want to give you rules to help you feel better or something like that. And that, that is generally how people view it. The, well, and Christians can come to this pretty easily, uh, or people raised in the Christian church. If, the, if their primary teaching uh, were the Ten Commandments, for example, if that's what they learned by heart, if that's what they spent most of their time talking about and studying, were the Ten Commandments, then, then they're like, well, there's God, and he has rules, and the rules are, are for my benefit, you know, so that my life goes well. Which actually isn't wrong, um, entirely, anyway. We, we would say, running with Paul, Romans, that the, prince, the primary reason why God gives us the commands isn't to show us how to live a better life, but it's to show us how we aren't. Yeah, so it has a negative use, right? Yeah, to show us our sin. So, um, yeah, so then listen to this part, because this, this will get us right into the first chapter in the book. As the study notes, a biblical worldview emerges from a high view of the Bible as a, quote, relevant and authoritative guide for life. Okay, those were the language they used in the study. Relevant and authoritative guide for life. Yet only 40% of parents of preteens say the Bible is trustworthy and accurate. 40%. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not trustworthy and accurate, so how can it be a relevant and authoritative guide for life? Right? So you can see that's, that's a key kind of... Um, that's something we have to talk about, and we're not... We're not I, I think at least I did. I only barely received this in my own catechesis, and I went through. I was born born and raised in the Lutheran Church, so. Um, oh no, no, he was a convert. Well, he was raised Methodist, and um, I don't think they would be ashamed of this. I mean, my my primary like instruction in the faith came through my mother, and my mother's side of the family. My, my grandfather was a. He did actually had a mission plant. He was, he was a lay person, but, but he was highly involved and served as an elder and congregation president and all that kind of stuff. So, um, <clears throat> so <laughs> and only of those, only 45, so of the 40% that said, no, of the, what do we want to say? Of who? Of those who say, oh, of the 40% who said the Bible's trustworthy and accurate, only 45% of them say they read the Bible at least once a week. So now we're down to 20%, less than 20%, even read the Bible, who think it's trustworthy and accurate and authoritative. So, um, so you can see where the, where, how do you end up with a worldview that isn't compatible with the Bible? Well, you don't actually read it. That's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, now, none of this is all that surprising, except the consequence, of course, is what does it do then, um, you know, to the, to the children, right? Where does it put the children? Where does it put the next generation? Yeah, they think they're a cat. That's right. Um, I mean, that's just one example. It's 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 clearly absurd, and yet they honestly believe it, right? Well, how do you end up in a position where you where you think that you can be something you're not, or as our president said, or whatever you want to call him, um, however you think you end up being president, selected or elected, doesn't really matter. He said that. Um, uh, referring to transgender children, that they were made in the image of God as transgender. In other words, God made them male, but he gave them female brains or something, right? Or female. And so that they, and, they, and it's God's will that they have the surgery, right? You can see all the implications of this. It was a totally absurd statement. He hadn't, clearly hadn't thought it through. I don't know if he can, but he hadn't. I, I don't like to speak ill of him, but he's clearly not in his right mind most of the time. Yeah, so if, you, if God made them to be not what they are. Uh, no, I think he was saying that they, he was trying to, con to say that, that God loves them, I think, is really what he was trying to say. Well, of course he loves them. Right. That doesn't mean that he wants them to mutilate their, their body, right. you know, chemically or otherwise, surgically, right? So that's, that just, 
it tells us why um, we need to start with the Bible, actually. <laughs> and that's, again, what we do with children, do this in the school um, every day. I mean, primary, well, it's not up there anymore, but that, that devotion that we do each day, most of the time we spend is we read the, the reading I have assigned for the day, and then we talk through it. And oh. Yeah, so, so like today was the road to Emmaus, right? So the question, it's simple questions, right? Well, how many disciples were on the road? Well, two. What were their names? One was Cleopas. The other one we don't know. Who showed up next to them? Jesus, right? They just prompt them for all these kind of questions and answers. Um, and it's, it's really just listening comprehension is what we're doing. That was I remember doing that with standardized testing back in the day. Listening comprehension 101. Um, but that's the first step to learning what the scriptures say is to actually hear it, right? And to learn how to listen. And then I teach them to listen for detail that way by asking those questions, but also we look for patterns. And this is, um, I don't know, I don't think people read this way. They don't look for pattern, rec they don't, they're not pattern recognition people. It, meaning like, but the scriptures are written this way. So uh, Jesus does, gives a famous example of this, right? He says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so the son of man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and then rise, right? In one of his predictions of his passion and death. He, he uses Jonah as, Jonah, Jonah that's, he tells us that that story of Jonah and the three days in the belly of the fish was to teach us about his death and resurrection. So he makes those, not as an analogy or a metaphor, but like um, the, the big word for this is, well, I don't need to write it down, it's typology. Yeah, yeah typology. And I, you can just call it pattern recognition. You just look and you say, wait a minute. Um, there's a lot of similarities in this story to stories we've heard before. You know, Jesus took the, like in the, Jesus goes with the disciples to Emmaus and they sit down um, at the table because they tell him, you know, stay with us because it's evening, right? And then he takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. And then their eyes are opened. Well, you hear those words. Those, they sound very familiar, right? Takes bread, blesses, breaks it, and gives it to the disciples, right? That's the words of institution, Right, the Lord's Supper. It's also what he does at the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, right? Which are, again, those are types of what comes later. So that's what also what we do with the children is to, um, <clears throat> I describe it this way, is just use their imagination, right? And say, wait a minute, um, this sounds familiar, right? Uh, where did we see this before? Oh, uh, you know, for example, in the resurrection story, Mary Magdalene um, meets Jesus in, in the garden, and she supposes the, the, garden, the tomb's in a garden in John's gospel. He describes it that way. And she thinks he's a gardener. I'm like, huh, does that have anything to do with, like, say, the beginning of the Bible? Are they in a garden? Is there Jesus? Jesus is walking with them and, and you know, conversing with them. So then you see, well, it's not one-to-one. -one, it's actually an inversion, right? Mm -hmm. In that garden, Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. In this garden, Jesus forgives sin, right, and restores the woman Right, Mary Magdalene is restored to faith. She's like the picture of Eve you know, on either end. And for me, that's just delightful. I just like doing that. I just enjoy seeing, uh, seeing the scripture as like um, what you might describe as like a tapestry, right? And then there's a golden thread that's woven through it, which is Jesus, mm -hmm. yeah. right? But it's this, it's this beautiful tapestry that's been woven by, whew, God only knows how many authors, right? Um, I mean, there's 66 books in the canonical New Testament, Old Testament that we have today. Um, although as Lutherans, we have an open canon, so we're willing to admit there might be other books, but at this point, be, there's no manuscript. I mean, what are, which books would they be? I don't know. But, um, but even like, now how many, how many different writers of Psalms do we have? Probably at least five come to mind right off the top of my head. So the Psalms are written by at least that many authors. Um, and then you have, of course, the authors, but then the scribes that actually helped, you know, dictate. So you have that as well. Um, and then, so that kind of leads me to a question. Yeah, good. The, um, the, the idea that <clears throat> every word in the Bible is the word of God. Yeah, that's what we're getting at, isn't it? Yeah. So. Or is it just inspired by God? Yeah, right, exactly. No, this is good. Um, Missouri Synod, our church body. Um, split in the late 60s, early 70s, major split. About 40% of our church left to form what is today the ELCA, 
Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Um, it was called Seminex, so Seminary in Exile. So most of our St. Louis Seminary faculty walked out and didn't come back and formed a secondary seminary on that question. Wow. Yeah, it was over the question of um, what are, how to define these terms uh, in... I'm so used to using spell check now. Fallible? Is it does it have an I in it, or is it just without an I? I can't remember. Infallible, inspired... Sorry if you don't like my handwriting. What's that? I could just do, yeah, doctor handwriting. Uh, inspired, and the other word was inerrant. All right, and so then our church body ended up um, splitting over this topic in particular. Uh, no, they're complementary. Yeah, they're complementary. And the... Uh, most of the St. Louis Seminary faculty at that point had been had trained in Europe. They had gone for like doctoral studies in Europe, which was all all already way down the. I, most of the theology faculties in Europe in in the fifties were Marxist. <laughs> so they were they were teaching Christian doctrine, but they were Marxist. So good luck with that, since they're mutually exclu- those are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Um, so they came back with what we call critical theory. You, that's been in the news now. You've heard like, um, what what is it? Uh, critical ra- um, race theory, right? It's yeah, based on yeah, yeah. It's based on critical theory, which is which is yeah, uh, basically back to Hegel before Marx. And uh, but it was being applied to the Bible first. Mm. Critical theory, yeah. So uh, there's a famous speaking of interpreting the Bible in this. Uh, no, it was early '80s. Um, there was a thing called the Jesus Seminar. You ever heard of this? So, so it was a bunch of, you know, very famous, you know, well-studied theologians. And they all, um, they would read a passage of the Bible together. And then they each had, they had, they had two stones uh, or tokens of some sort. And there was two different colors, black and red, right? So if they thought it was, and then, oh, they actually they had three. They had black, red, and white. All right, so if they didn't think it was authentically scripture, they put up the white stone in the, into the bag. If they thought it was scripture, but not words of Jesus, they put the black in. And if they thought Jesus actually said it, they put red in. All right, this is how you end up in your Bible with the red letter Bibles, where Jesus' words are in red. This is where this comes from. I mean, anyway, so then they would take out all the stones from all the, and they would say, well, we've got, I remember, there's 20 some guys, right? All guys too, not girls. <laughs> Today, there would be it'd be more than it'd be sixty or seventy percent women, probably. Uh, biblical scholarship that world is mostly women today. Like at most most higher higher education stuff, I think, is at least sixty percent. Right. Same with biblical studies. Regardless, they they would take the stones and they say, "Well, all right, so we have this thing that's purportedly a saying of Jesus, and we've got three red, you know, six black, and then eleven white." Well, we don't even think this is authentic. This shouldn't even belong in the Bible. We're just going to disqualify that. All right, and they went through the Bible and did this. Now, this is nothing new. Now, I say it's 80s. Thomas Jefferson did this to his Bible because he was trained in Europe in the, in the 19th century, right? 18th century, excuse me. Yeah, you can, uh, I think it, is, it might be at the Smithsonian or maybe National Archives. They've got his Bible. And he just, he used like what equivalent of an exacto knife and he just cut out the parts he didn't like. And it's all just, it's this hodgepodge of Bible. And you can get printed copies. He took out all the miracles, because of course those couldn't have happened. He was a realist, scientific realism. Yeah. Yeah, so this isn't, I mean, that's the founding of our country, right? So it's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so this process has been going on. And so anyway, that the fact that the Missouri Senate broke up over it, I mean, it's, it was probably, there was probably a, a fair amount of that in, in congregations. My, uh, I'll tell you another anecdote before we answer this. <laughs> Sorry, I have all sorts of stories. Um, I try not to be boring, but sometimes that means I'm a little scatterbrained because <laughs> I think of interesting things. Um, tell me if I get boring or if I get off, too off topic for you. Okay. All right. Uh, no, anyway, my, uh, uh, I have on my mother's side, you know, uh, historically Lutheran for a long, you know, generations and generations. So I think probably like five generations back, um, we had a 
pastors, a number of pastors in a row. I'm the first pastor on my mom's side of the family in like three generations. But before that, there usually was one every generation, at least one. And they wrote, they wrote autobiographies. So the one that came over from Germany, um, Johann Werfelmann, he would have been, I think uh, he's actually related to Momskans, one of our previous pastors here. I just completely inadvertently. Yeah, I, I want to say like, Wamscons is his nephew. Anyway, so this pastor comes over. He goes to the what became the Fort Wayne Seminary uh, before the Missouri Synod was even founded. Um, the seminary was founded before the the Synod, and um, he he notes in his autobiography that he his pastor in Germany didn't even believe he didn't believe any of the Bible was true. Never taught him the Catechism, etc. This was eighteen. 50s, 1840s is when he writes this. Right. So it's nothing new is the point. And our church body has been struggling with it since we were founded, right? Because our pastors that, the pastors that became part of the church body at the beginning intentionally were looking for fellow pastors, congregations, a church body, a group of congregations that taught that the Bible was infallible, inspired, and inerrant are the terms. The problem is these terms came from, not from Lutherans, this is why a lot of Lutherans got upset with them. These are terms from the fundamentalists. So you've heard the fun of fundamentalism? Yeah, it was a, probably, I don't remember the years, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, there were revivals of sorts. These were the people that said that the Bible uh, was true, right? And in traditions that didn't actually say that. And the Lutherans had historically said that, but were departing from it. And they came up with these terms, but I still think they're good terms, even though they're not, we're borrowing them. All right. So infallible, uh, or fallible, I think it's fallible. So I have to Google it. In, yeah, cannot fail. Right. So um, we would just say, oh, I don't know. It does what it says. All right. So that's how I would define that. So it does what it's... Um, Yes, that's part of infallible. That's correct. Um, at least in the classical definition. But it does what it says. So if Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, then we say, okay, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. When you do this, this is what it is. Right? It doesn't fail in that. Or if he says, I baptize you, or whoever believes in his baptized will be saved. Then whoever believes in his baptized will be saved. Because that's what it says. This seems like crazy that you would have to actually defend that. But there are a lot of people that said... Well, it might have done that for the people back then, but it doesn't do that now. Like, right. uh, you should bear the second amendment, you know? People say it's like... Oh, yeah. Bear arms means bear arms. There's like whole and stuff. You have to pull up your sleeves or something? Yeah. Oh, it means you can't have a cannon. I love how they're saying it means you can't have a cannon when it literally means you can't have a cannon. Right. No, it, do it doesn't say what kind of arm you can't have. If you want a cannon in your front yard, you have a cannon in your front yard. Or, I guess. But it's a little... Right, right. We're, we're, yeah. Um, well, part of that, I think, is, is it's a good analogy because um, it depends on how you want to approach the Bible. If you want to approach it as what, what are the limits to what we can do or who we are or what we can say or whatever, whereas um, our approach to the Bible is um, what freedoms does it give, right? What does it let us, you know? It, there are constraints. There's kind of a perimeter, if you like, you know, that Jesus establishes, stay with me, right? Um, but within that, there's incredible freedom, you know? Um, and uh, most, so the question about the Second Amendment is most people are saying, well, what does it prevent you from doing? Whereas the Second Amendment is saying, no, what does it allow you to do, right? It's what are, the, what are your freedom? Your freedom is to bear arms, and it doesn't even define what that means. There's some interpreta judicial interpretation sense, but... This whole argument about, well, you can't have, you know, certain magazine sizes and not really. That's not what it's about. Or how, how many rounds you can fire. What You want to have a 50 caliber, you have a 50 caliber. I mean, it's not probably cost effective for most people, but <laughs> it's a little overkill for most applications like self-defense. But it would work. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, inspired, and that's the question that we were that got us into this. The reason why this came up. So inspired means uh, breathed into, <laughs> literally. Yeah, 
Um, so this is why we have to define these terms to breathe into. So um, the breath of God is the Holy Spirit. It's the same word. Spirit and breath, Old Testament is the same word. Ruach. Ruach. Yeah. R-U-A-H is how we usually transliterate it. Yeah. So when God breathes, he speaks and he gives life. It all goes together. So when he speaks, he's breathing on you. So did the, the, the Lutherans that the evangelicals, they said, we can cut stuff out. Mm -hmm. said, no, we got to take all of it. They don't, they don't believe that it's been breathed into yeah. by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, key to that, to way back to really the question that prompted all of this, is we have all these authors, we have all these books, and they're written over a span of thousands of years, right? Um, how is it possible? I mean, I guess that's one question. How is it possible that they could tell one story? which is Jesus' argument. Jesus says, all scripture testifies of me. So that the, the whole purpose of everything written from Moses through to the prophets, the Psalms in between, you know, the, the, even the wisdom literature, everything, is to lead you to faith in him. To, tell, to teach you of him and to lead you to faith in him. Um, even the histories, right? Well, how is that possible um, when you have so many disparate authors and they have different purposes um, they don't necessarily write for the same reasons. They don't have the necessarily the same perspective, right? I mean, even among the evangelists, we have four evangelists. Um, John had had a you know firsthand view, right? He was the he's the guy up in the in the in the felt. <laughs> I love the felt. It's dusty, and I don't know who made it, but we can't ever get rid of it. Is it? Yeah. Well, it's got a lot of shadows. The guy who's leaning on Jesus' shoulder there. Is that's that's John in in Michelangelo? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he has literally the closest firsthand view of everything going on. So John has a lot a lot of details that are unique to John. So he was an evangelical, and then he just he just said, "Hey, all we need is just part of Jesus." No, oh. no, John, John, the evangelist John, the guy oh, who wrote the Gospel of John. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, then you have somebody like Matthew, who is another who is another disciple, but he would have been farther out. I don't remember which one he is, according to Michelangelo. Yeah. Well, this is a, based on the painting by Michelangelo of the Last Supper. Right. All right. So one of those guys is Matthew. Right. So he had another viewpoint, but he was pretty close. He was in the 12. Right. Then you have Luke, who wasn't one of the disciples. He was one of Paul's um, fellow workers. So he, he worked with Paul. Um, Luke, apparently, he interviewed apparently what I think like St. Mary, because he, he tells us the stories of Jesus' birth. Matthew has some of those, but, but Luke, when we hear at Christmas time, we hear from Luke, right? Um, so it seems, you know, who else would know about like the visit of Mary to Elizabeth and except for Mary herself, right? And he gives us some clues to that in the gospel. Um, so Luke is doing some interviews, I think mostly with Mary, who was there through the whole ministry of Jesus. So that would, that would work. Um, and then you have Mark, who is another uh, disciple of, of Peter, excuse me, of Paul, also of Peter. And um, his is the, the shortest gospel. And um, it's not clear necessarily who he's writing. He's, I know who he's writing for. He's writing for the church in Rome, but it's not clear to me um, who he talked to to get his account. Right. So we have these four different people that are telling the same story of Jesus' birth, ministry, life, death, suffering, resurrection, ascension into heaven, but they don't all tell it the same way, right? So they have different purposes. And yet we'd still say that they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so the key, maybe the key way to understand this to your question, Matt, is to think of the writers of the gospels as um, the Holy Spirit's instruments. Mm -hmm. So we like to use that word instrumentality. That's how we think of pastors in our church too. I'm just God's instrument. Right, I'm here to do what God gives me to do. Well, what would be some of the examples in the Bible that are like the hardest to, oh, believe, shoot. hardest to believe that they were pretty Oh, uh, well, I Jonah know. was a big one. I mean, with the split in our church body, part of that was Jonah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that was, one of the, that was one of the like litmus tests. Well, do you think Jonah was actually swallowed by a fish or not? So was it a historic event or was it a mythological event? Right. right. And so what they, what they would do is they would say, well... Well, it's not that it's not true, it's just not historically true. So the spiritual reality of it, you know, that God preserved Jonah, something like that, um, it still has that kind of moral or spiritual benefit, 
but it doesn't matter whether it actually happened or not. Right? Like a myth. It's kind of like the, the apple and the snake and such. Exactly. Necessarily an apple and a... Right. Famously, a, a reformed uh, critical, uh, one who followed some critical theory, a reformed theologian, famously said this actually at a um, Bible conference back in, I think in the 40s already. Um, a woman asked him, he's like, you know, it, did the serpent actually speak? Because that's what Genesis says, right? The serpent spoke. And he said, it doesn't matter whether the serpent spoke or not. It's what the serpent said that matters. Do you see the nuance to that? It's like, you know, whether it, what he's effectively said is it doesn't actually matter whether it happened or not. It just matters that the words were said. Or was it spoken or was it just entered into her mind? No, it's just in that. Yeah. Um, but f the historic Lutheran position in particular, and I think for a lot of Roman Catholics this would have been true, and, and many Protestants today as well, um, of the more conservative you know, traditions, say that it actually is, it's, it's important that it, that it, see we don't even have a term up here for this, I should just add another term, that it is historic, or that it's history, that it, it accurately records things that happened. You know, I guess that connects to infallible in a way, right? That it's it's not just true, but it's that it, that it, it the things when it when it purports to be history, it is history. Now there's places where this gets a little challenging, because the standards of history are are pretty um, pretty consistent from the ancient world to the present. It's like well, you need eyewitnesses, right? You know, otherwise it's like well, you just made it up. So and and two or more is better, right? So if you have two, two is the minimum in the ancient world. Three is better. Um, of course, we know eyewitness testimony isn't necessarily accurate because they could be colluding, you know, conspiring together, or they could be seeing a, they could be all delusional of some sort, um, or they're all on a, some kind of hallucinogenic trip or something, right? And they happen to see the same thing. There are things that people have common experiences with hallucinations, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> the light at the end of the tunnel, for example, right? It's a common thing. Um, but that, that's not what we're talking about. So uh, as far as history goes, as far as history goes, so you have multiple eyewitnesses, uh, also hostile witnesses, right? So like in the case of Jesus' resurrection, what did the Jews say of, of Jesus' day? How did they respond to this? We have Jewish historians like Josephus, right? What did the Roman historians say? So you look at like the actual record, um, their uh, historical record, Tacitus is one of the, Roman historians that records Jesus' resurrection. Oh, yeah. yeah, they record it as if it happened, but they don't acknowledge, they don't acknowledge they understand like why he wasn't in the tomb and why he appeared to people, it seemed, after. That's a different yeah, so that you look at um, Josephus's, what does he call it? I think he just calls it histories. I don't remember what Tacitus' book is called. I have some of these over in my study. So those are hostile witnesses. These are people that have every every, uh, what do you want to say? There'd be every benefit for them to reject the truth of the scripture <laughs> or the truth that Jesus rose from the dead in particular, right? Still, and yet they still acknowledge that it appears to have happened. Okay, so that's helpful. Um, other things, of course, like archaeological proof, like do we have the bones, that kind of thing. I'm just using the resurrection as an example here, right? Um, so medical, scientific, you know, his, historiographic, um, trying to think. Yeah, that's probably enough. I mean, to the point where you can say, well, at least you need to take it seriously <laughs> because um, there's more demonstrable proof for Jesus' resurrection than there is that, I don't know, that, um, uh, you know, the, of the evidence of the Aeneid or the Odyssey actually even being written by Homer. <laughs> right, so now that's the point. So you go back to flood, something like the flood. Um, we do have some, I think, you know, it's potentially we have scientific geograph, you know, geology and these kind of things that can kind of demonstrate that. We also, you know, fossil record might help. Maybe not. May contradict. Maybe help. You have the whole dinosaur question. All right. But now if you go back before the flood, it gets a little bit challenging to demonstrate that that's actual history. Right? I mean, especially if you want to talk about creation. Because who alone witnessed all of creation? It's only God, Right? And then it's not recorded until Moses, which is after the exile. So 400 years after Abraham 
goes to the promised land before the 400 whatever years before they come back. So you're talking about, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, even in an oral culture where they're transmitting it down, you know, it's a lot harder to, to demonstrate historically that the, the account of creation happened. You know, even in a scientific way, maybe. I, I mean, I guess you could do Big Bang. And then you get into the dating issue, right? What was it 6,000 some years ago? Or was it old Earth, young Earth? There's all these things. People get all hung up on this stuff. Unnecessarily, in my opinion. Um, because... Um, from my, from my standpoint, the defense of the infallible and inspired part of the Bible is that um, we can, we can with, with a high degree of cert, certain, certitude, I guess, certainty, say that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and he said he was going to, and then he did it, which nobody else has done, right, in the history of the world. And there's people who said they've done it mythologically, but we don't have historic proof that they did, right? So... So maybe we should take Jesus at his word about other things then too, right? So when Jesus says that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, Jesus is the one who confirms the historic account for Moses, you see. Or he refers to Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three days. Now, it's not very believable. It's hard to believe. I, it's, I mean, it's miraculous, right? Well, it's hard to believe that. Well, right. Yeah. 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 Right. So um, from our perspective, and this, this all came out of this, the, this split in the Missouri Senate and having to wrestle with how do we talk about um, the Bible's truthfulness and it's inspired them and it's inerrancy. So do they make mistakes? Do they, and they do sometimes, but are they, are they um, significant mistakes? Meaning mistakes that actually affect its meaning or, its pur or, or the purpose. You know, so for example, I mentioned if you ask Moses, um, ex, uh, if you ask Moses, they were in exile in the in Egypt for 430 years. Is that right? Yeah, 400 years, or 430 years. And then you ask Paul in Galatians, and he says it's 400 years. I was like, well, did he make a mistake? Did he forget the other 30 years? Did he not know his Bible? Which one is true, et cetera, et cetera? And it's like they were in exile for 400 ish years. <laughs> See. They, and they don't necessarily have the same sense of history we do. We treat history like it has to be scientific today. Like, like it's not real history unless everything lines up perfectly. And it's like, well, think of like a, a, a famous event uh, of recent history. Oh, well, one that's still on trial, January 6th, right? You know, we stormed the Capitol, right? Well, depending on who you ask, it could have been any number of things happened. You know, you ask some people at one door, well, they just told us to come in and they, get, they acted like it was a tour. You ask people another, at another entrance, it's like, no, there were people pounding on the door and they broke it down. Well, so which was it? Well, it was actually both, right? Depending on where you were at the building and who was there. And, and then, you know, some people say they were bad actors. They have all these accounts. And the truth is somewhere in the midst of all of that. But it's all history. It's just from different perspectives. So Lutherans believe basically that every word in the Bible Historic, infallible, inspired, and errant with a level of tolerance, yeah. plus or minus X number of years. Yeah, maybe plus tolerance. Or minus a little bit of interpretation about whether it is a, you know, a mistake. Or well, I, I think, no, not, maybe not there, but, but definitely for authorial intent is, is probably the language I think we use. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to speak, I might be getting off uh, outside of orthodoxy here, but, but. Meaning, like I said with the Gospels, they don't record the same details. They have the same central events. Of course, Jesus died and rose again, and being the five thousand is in all four gospels, for example, right? But they don't all tell the story with the same for the same purpose, right? Maybe one is trying to indicate like um, Jesus' providence, like that he that he feeds us, that he takes care of us. Another might be emphasizing his divinity, that he can miraculously multiply, you know, uh, or maybe they, they each have a different amount of degree of each of those elements. So they they're not necessarily emphasizing the same for the same reason or same purpose. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean that the details um, don't matter. Mm -hmm. But they don't always have to matter, I guess is the point. Well, it's kind of like with the, when the, um, Israel was in Egypt. Right. And Baal, some were beaten, some were tortured, or whatever. Right, right. Maybe some got away. But the the key is they were in slavery. And then they got out, right. You're right, the exactly. Overall, okay. They were in slavery. Uh, Pharaoh was 
putting hard labor on them. He increased their labor, made their life miserable. He was killing their sons so that he could marry off their daughters to Egyptian men. And inter, I mean, this is a great way to conquer a nation, right? It's just intermarry them and then it's done. We have to kill off the males. Because, you, of course, you have both in Egyptian and Hebrew culture, you've got the family line come, comes through the men, through the males, male children. So that's why they cut that off. All right, inerrant uh, means that it doesn't make mistakes. So that's pretty easy. No mistakes. So those were the three kind of topics. I know this came up. It wasn't exactly what we were going to talk about, but I'm happy to do that, by the way. We can just go wherever we need to go um, and get to the things we need to get to. Yeah, and, and, the, and again, this is also that, um, I was going to pull up a Bible. We have extras if you don't bring one, but you probably need to bring one each week. Um, uh, this helps answer a question like, okay, this is a New International Bible. This is a Revised Standard Bible. There's other versions over there. There's a King James over there. There's probably a nice, nice old one in here somewhere. Uh, here's a... The standard. What's this? Ooh, this was this was the one that would be used up at the altar. Oh, cool. This is King James. Yeah. Samuel also said unto Saul, "The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people." Right. So, so they would say like. Um, so which Bible is the authoritative one, right? Which some, translation? There's some stuff in there that like the evangelicals would say. Well, if you don't just cut that out, it's not right. inspired. Right. Right. Maybe that was kind of like, didn't seem like it was relevant or it was kind of a bad thing or happened, right. but it's still part of the overall. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and often the things that are the most uncomfortable to read are probably the things we need to read. That's, that's, that's just a, that's more of the art of interpretation, but just saying, um, there's a, I mean, we spent all of Lent on Wednesday nights going through um, Psalms of Lament, basically whining, how to whine to God. <laughs> So there's, there's whole psalms or large chunks of psalms that you literally just pour out your complaints. And it just sounds like you're complaining, right? But it gives you permission to do that. And we, and we think, oh, no, God doesn't want to hear our complaints. No, actually, according to the prayer book he gives us, he actually tell, he instructs us to pray this way. Yeah, like he wants, and he loves to hear it, actually. You know, unlike a parent who can't stand the child whining at them. <laughs> you know? Uh, there is a difference, though, in the Psalms of Lament, um, where the end of the lament is actually a petition then to say, here's, what I, here, here's almost a demand, give me this in response to that. Much like we do in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. You know, just straight up not pretty pleased with a cherry on top or something. Right? Um, there's even more difficult readings. A lot of the histories, you know, hear about... A woman driving a tent peg through a guy's head. I mean, that's kind of brutal. Uh, the kids love it. It's a fun story. That's J.L. is her name. Uh, First Kings, I think. So, I mean, there's stories like that that are a little bit, you know, embrace the brutality of life in this world. That's like another one that was that breathing through the Holy Yeah. So why? So then, so it begs the question, right? What? purpose could the Holy Spirit possibly have for us knowing this to learn this story yeah. right yeah um, and then that um, that kind of directs kind of the devotional aspect of it then to meditate upon it and to say okay well is this text used somewhere else does Jesus quote it does one of the apostles quote it you know does this account uh, is this place maybe um, described somewhere else does something else happen in the same place uh, and maybe the two events are connected right there's different ways to go about this um, and, but see, I guess we have to back up one big step with this because of the inspired part is that, yes, we believe that we believe that the Bible is inspired, but there's the key we believe. So you can't actually say you won't actually believe any of these things may be historic, but these three require the Holy Spirit given to you. Are you, are you not going to receive it this way? So you, without the Holy Spirit, you won't see the scriptures as from the Spirit. It's the Spirit who actually testifies. Yeah, yeah. To the, says, yeah. yeah, does he? Good. Um, same thing with inerrant. Like, I can't demonstrate, like with, 
Um, I, can't, I can do a good deal of demonstration that the errors can be easily addressed, so quote-unquote errors. Uh, there's famous Bible scholar who doesn't believe any of it. His name is Bart Ehrman. You ever heard of Bart Ehrman? All right. He's at, I want to say Duke or, De or Yale. I can't remember where he is. Divinity School. Um, no, he's at North Carolina Chapel Hill. Yeah. Anyway, he, um, he says 98% of the Bible is, 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 has errors in it. Well, and by that he means like punctuation. Oh, no, there's no punctuation. No, he means things like they forgot to put the little line above the Yoda, which is like an I. Anyway, really? yeah, things like that. Um, and I, oh, I can actually put this up on the screen. There's a um, critical edition. So I mean, we're not afraid to do this. A lot of Bible traditions will say we don't know how to handle anything, so we are King James only. This translation of the Greek and Hebrew done 1,480 years ago. We only use that version because everything else are non-believing, people calling themselves Christians, translating it and introducing errors to it. Which is like, well, yeah, but this is still a translation too. Right. But you, you actually run into another problem, which is that, let me see if I can show you this. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, so there's a Greek of, what, what verse are we in here? Oh, that's Old Testament. We don't want Greek Old Testament. Here's Greek New Testament next to the English, right? So you can compare the two, put them side by side and say, all right, uh, they brought little children to Jesus, right? And then we go over and we look at the Greek of the same thing. Kai prose, uh, ephron, auto, paideia, that's children, hina, in order that, obsetai, auto, right? So we look at the, at the Greek. Right? And we compare the two and we say, well, that's an okay translation. It could be translated better. It could be translated worse. Lutherans do this. Right? So we try to go back to the original language. Our pastors all learn Greek and mostly all learn Hebrew as well. Which one's more of a Greek? Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek. Oh. With some exceptions, there's some Aramaic in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, but here's the problem. Um, you can see there's all sorts of little colored letters over here. I'll just give you an example of that. So there, um, apsatai, there's a variant. So in some manuscripts of the, of whatever gospel this is, which one was it? I think we're in Luke, right? Um, and the Nestle Oland, which is a compilation that they're on the 28th edition of this, of all the different manuscripts, and they compare them and they try to decide which one's the the most authentic. And with the UBS, that's the something Bible scholars or something, they have it as apsatai auton or auton apsatai. Oh, so see, Bart Ehrman is right. Some manuscripts have an error here. You know, it's not hard to see what the error is. They just reverse the two words. They change the word order. So some some, some scholars would say, this is the Texas Receptus. You don't have to understand that. So, oh, but see, it's an error because in some places they got the words in the different order. Well, in Greek, it actually doesn't matter. Oh, it just means um, in order to touch them, touch them. So some say touch them and others say them touch. But in Greek, it, that, that's not actually, it's just an emphasis a difference. It's not, it doesn't work the same as English grammar. All right. But, oh, look, there's mistakes. Some of the copies have, they actually have the same two words. It's just, right. So, well, so, right. But here, for us as Lutherans, it's like, that's all great. Let's actually do all that work. Let's get all the copies. Now we can do it with computers, and it's brilliant. Compare every copy of every book that we have, all the way from the first century, all the way through, the oldest copies to the newest copies. Compare it to the Syriac version to the Coptic, the Egyptian versions, look at their copy, look at the Arabic, you know, the ones that were translated into Arabic in the 8th century, compare it to those, right? And see, you know, and then look at the Hebrew from a thousand, you know, like comparing Old Testament Hebrew, the Old Testament Greek, because there's a Greek Old Testament, right? And do all that work to see what's true, right? And what you find is, I think Bart Ehrman has it completely backwards. There's about 2% of the Bible where you would say, uh, this is a little bit challenging, you know, uh, especially apocryphal writings. 
Um, but the very end of the Gospel of Mark, which we're gonna, I'm actually going to talk about in church tonight, is one of those examples where it's, it's very disputed as to whether or not it's authentic. The last, like, 12 verses or so. It doesn't, but it doesn't actually affect faith, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's our doctrine of the Bible. Is that what I was going to talk about? That's a good place to start. Uh, maybe that's what, I mean, that's a good introduction then for you to read chapter one, which starts on page one. Um, and that will get us through, we can talk about what we believe about the scriptures, see if we missed anything there. I don't think we did. And then if, if, if we can work through that pretty quickly next time, then we can move on to walking through the liturgy. There's some other things I'd like to do with you maybe before we do that, though. Just all preliminary. All right? So that's... I don't usually want to go more than an hour. Just... I have church at 7. so I hear him playing in there, so... Getting things ready, I mean. <laughs> so that's, that's my key. That's my cue? Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, go, I mean, read as much as you want. Right. We can, work, we can work through whatever. Yeah, if you've got some leisure time, you can work through it. If you've got questions, you can uh, email me or text or whatever, or we can call. Although I, calling, I tend to do best with asynchronous stuff. Cause what? Asynchronous, meaning not we have to talk together at the same time. It's my schedule, right? But, so if you email me, I can respond when I can. And da, 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 we can go back and forth. But we can talk in person too. I just set an appointment for that. Uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah, because one of the things we have to talk about is like why, why have a church at all? <laughs> I know that seems kind of silly, but it's actually, I think, a relevant question.